never see it coming. It's a long time Mac family. Uh, they had a lot of experience with uh, machinery and everything. So it was way, it, it, was, it was really fun to be part of. So this is a really important topic and uh, thank you guys for coming out. Thanks for having me up. Good afternoon, my name is uh, Chris Johnson and I'm the Off-Highway Vehicle Education Coordinator for the Department of Game and Fish. I've been doing this job for coming up on five years. And uh, prior to that, I was a motorcycle safety instructor with the street bike program here in New Mexico. Uh, former desert racer, uh, uh, street bike rider, just motorcycle nut basically. Uh, ATVs are a tool as far as I'm concerned. Uh, with me today is Officer Desi Ortiz, go ahead. Chris understands his history with uh, off-highway vehicles. He's taught, he's ridden, his kids ride, his wife rides. I mean, they, he probably has 15 bikes in his, in his garage. 16. 16. <laughs> oh, yeah, Chris does it all. So, uh, yeah, I'm a Desi uh, game warden with the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. I'm also the law enforcement coordinator for this program. So what I do is I go around state teaching law enforcement how to enforce. We manage a grant program. Uh, when you operate on public land, you have to register that vehicle. We'll go over all that, but uh, all that money comes back to us, and in turn, we give it back in the form of uh, free safety training for kids, for adults, for agencies. Uh, we give law enforcement money to go out there and actually enforce what we're trying to, to uh, accomplish, you know, keep kids safe. That's the whole reason for it. Chris will give you the history of, of the program and why it came about. Uh, it took us a, a while to get it. Every other state around us has an established program, we're relatively new in the game. Um, but if a question comes up during our, our discussion today, guys, feel free to ask. Uh, we'll keep the war stories to a minimum. I, I, just real quick, show of hands, how many of you guys have ever have been on a ATV, a side-by-side, -side, a motorcycle, a snowmobile? A good portion of it. And of those who have, ridden, have raised their hands, how many of you guys have had an accident or fallen off or the majority of you guys, and that's what I usually do. I go when I teach, I ask for a show of hands, and yeah, sure enough, same people, people who've ridden, who've either known or have had an accident. So, just know, like Chris said, these are our tools, they are toys, but um, yeah, the thing that gets people in trouble, especially parents and kids, is hey, that's a, that's a babysitter because my kids aren't going to be out on the street doing something stupid. I know where they are, they're out uh, riding responsibly. And little do they know, you know, these machines are heavy and, and it gets people in a lot of trouble. So with that, we'll, we'll uh, continue with our presentation. Like I said, questions come up, guys, feel free to ask. That's what we're here for. Uh, like Desi mentioned, uh, another show of hands, how many of you use uh, either ATVs or side-by-sides on a daily basis on your property? Okay, so not too many right now, but it's happening more and more. People are finding these to be very useful tools uh, and they're being sold with accessories that make them very useful. So uh, uh, we will be saying a lot more about it. Today I'm gonna be talking about the accident data. Uh, we'll, we'll look at uh, nationally and in New Mexico, a little bit of information about accidents. We'll talk about the uh, Off-Highway Motor Vehicle Act, that's the law. Uh, that requires uh, certain things of recreational off-highway vehicle users. Uh, we'll talk about the requirements for youth. Uh, we'll talk about the safety training that's available to you in New Mexico free of charge uh, or for a minor, minor fee, fee. And then we'll leave you with uh, a way to do a safety inspection on your own machine, what we call T-Clock. So a little bit about the accidents. Uh, accident data is compiled by the Consumer Product Safety Com uh, Commission and unfortunately that accident data uh, lags by about four years. So it takes a while for the federal government to receive reports and they're typically reports from emergency room, uh, hospitals, surgeons, uh, other uh, medical folks that see accident victims either injuries or fatalities, send the information in the form of coded uh, diagnostic sheets uh, to the CDC, and then that information comes to the Consumer Product Safety Commission, and then they compile that information. So uh, na nationwide from 1982 to 2014, the CPS recorded uh, fatalities uh, uh, it, uh, for kids uh, of under 16, about 23% of the percent of fatalities uh, reported were uh, 
the kids under 16. And 43% of those youth fatalities were kids under 12. So we can see that the, although the adults still make up the vast majority of the accidents and injuries, uh, the kids are, are significantly, significantly represented and there's things that we can do to make that better. Uh, the trend is actually going down on ATV injuries and you might think that's a good thing. Safety wise we're getting better. Now what's happening is the ROVs, the side by side machines are displacing the ATVs in the market. Uh, people are aware of the hazards regarding ATVs so they're buying the side by side vehicles instead because they've got roll cages, they've got seat belts, steering wheels, they can haul more cargo, things like that. So now we're seeing the, the uh, ROV numbers going down and the ROV numbers are starting to increase with usage. Uh, so for ATVs uh, from, uh, uh, in New Mexico, from 1982 to 2011, there were 110 fatalities uh, reported on ATVs in New Mexico. And from 2012 to 2014, there were 23. Uh, and then uh, from 24 to, 2014 to 2018, we're racking our brain to think of known fatalities here in New Mexico. Uh, and we know of four uh, fatalities for sure. The problem is that we don't get direct reporting from either the law enforcement uh, responders or from the hospitals. We're trying to fix that. We're trying to get into the path of those diagnostic uh, coded sheets uh, that get sent off to the CDC. And that will give us a better handle on the information. Uh, as far as the uh, fatalities that we know of, two kids that were hurt, uh, uh, one, uh, killed, uh, one by Farmington, and another one was uh, on private property riding his dad's full-sized ATV, uh, two adults that we know of, um, and then uh, ROV fatalities uh, that we know of in 2017. We know of three adults here in New Mexico that were killed, uh, uh, typically on rollovers, and uh, uh, the uh, one was the um, fellow that was operating out by Grants. He was on a paved road. Uh, first day of hunting season, he was out scouting and flipped his uh, side by side. He was not wearing a seat belt. He was not wearing a helmet. The, the other story real quick is uh, two gentlemen up in the uh, El Rito area. They had taken safety class because when they went to recover the body, they found the safety card, which we're going to talk about here in a bit. Uh, these machines, these side by sides have a, a, a regulator or a governor on it. If you don't buckle in, it's going to restrict you to about 15 miles per hour. So they, as you know, as adults, were pretty smart. So they buckled in behind, behind themselves and tore off down the road. Well, they came across a, a corner that they couldn't navigate. Rolled the machine. The uh, passenger got ejected. Cracked his head open. Uh, the, the driver, or the bigger gentleman, he went down the embankment with the side-by-side -side and it pinned him, it essentially flattened him backwards uh, into a nice little taco and he was dead at the scene. There was alcohol, of course, there, but uh, I, you know, these machines, they, they're, they're really fun, but if you don't follow what the manufacturer recommends, you know, the bad things happen. As I said, the reporting systems don't work very well right now here in New Mexico, uh, and we are taking action so that we get better information on a more timely basis. Uh, so the SVIA, that's the Specialty Vehicle Institute of America, and that's the ATV manufacturers gathered together as a trade industry uh, association, uh, and they also uh, uh, created the ATV Safety Institute, and they pay for most of its operations. Uh, and they warn that uh, ATV re related fatalities involve behaviors that they warn against. So that includes operating under the influence of drugs or alcohol, riding too fast for conditions, which covers a whole bunch, uh, operating on paved roads, these machines are not designed to be operated on pavement, uh, carrying passengers on single rider, single rider machines, uh, not wearing helmets or other, other protective gear, uh, kids riding on full-sized ATVs, big problem nationwide, and kids without supervision. So those are all things that the industry is warning people not to do, and those are the ways that, are peop that people are getting into trouble on the ATVs. It's like that old joke where the guy goes in and says, Doc, it hurts when I do this, and the doc says, well, stop doing that. So if we can stop doing these things, we're going to make these machines a lot safer. 
Uh, Arova is the uh, Recreational Off-Highway Vehicle uh, uh, Association, and uh, they're the manufacturers of the side-by-side -side machines. Uh, we call them either ROVs or also UTVs, or also side-by-sides. And these are the safety rules that they recommend using seat belts, helmets, helmets, and other safety gear, keeping your body parts inside the machine at all times. Of course, no driving under the influence, uh, driving at a safe speed for conditions, and using caution when turning or crossing slopes, because these machines are fairly top heavy. Uh, they don't have a lot of uh, roll rollover resistance on a, on a steeply sloped angle, so you have to be very careful when you're in that kind of environment. You want to make sure you don't overload the machine with passengers or cargo. And uh, operators should be at least 16 years old with a driver's license. That's what the industry is recommending. And of course, no driving on paved roads. Uh, so as a safety summary, what we're seeing nationwide and in New Mexico is that most accidents are rollovers. And they're usually as a result of driving too fast for the conditions that uh, uh, people are uh, encountering. Turns. Uh, bumpy terrain, things like that. Yeah, you're right. So, you know, we talk about speed kills and, and uh, you, you get out of control sometimes. Chris and I have first-hand experience of rolling uh, an AT or a uh, side-by-side. He was actually making a turn during the training. The wheels locked up because they were brand new, really gnarly tread, and he dumped it five miles an hour to keep in that. Yeah. I was yeah. making a turn the other day on my brand new machine, first time I took it out. I slid one corner went to go throw a U-turn and that thing dumped over on me. So it doesn't take much to roll them, even though the, uh, the manufacturer gives you all the guidelines. And, and I wasn't doing anything negligent, and neither was Chris. These things, I, yeah. And the lesson is don't lend either Desi or me your machines. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, most uh, ROV and UTV fatalities result from ejection or partial ejection, and uh, seat belts make huge difference with that. So uh, now that story of the of the 12 year old girl uh, sounds like she was wearing a seatbelt, but they're just the three point harnesses like you've got in your car. Uh, you can outfit them with four point or even five point harnesses, and those will improve the safety. Um, and it still comes down to a question of are you going to use the seatbelt, and how much risk are you willing to take when you're operating these machines? So injuries can be prevented by wearing safety gear and seatbelts and ROVs and UTVs and by slowing down. Uh, Off-highway vehicles of all types are not designed or intended for paved road use, uh, and adding DOT equipment does not change design limitations of the machines. Question? You look like you're getting ready to... There you go. All right. So uh, here in New Mexico, we've got a recent change to the law that allows for paved road use of these machines in some areas if there's a local ordinance that's been passed. I'll talk more about this in just a bit. Uh, and what people are doing nationwide is they're adding DOT kits that uh, provide the machines with turn signals, uh, dimmable headlights, um, mirrors, things like that. All the legal things that you need to have to operate a machine on the street in certain jurisdictions. But that doesn't change the physics of the way these machines operate. They're still high center of gravity. The tires, the suspension really aren't designed for paved road use. Uh, pressure from the users and also pressure because of the economic benefit from OHV tourism. So um, uh, the Off-Highway Motor Vehicle Act is the law that uh, we operate under uh, that uh, provides for the funding stream for our program. And uh, it came about back in 2005 because of some high profile accidents and fatalities that occurred back in around 2003. Among them was the son of the uh, Albuquerque, publisher, Albuquerque Journal publisher. Uh, and that's a whole nother story. The things he was doing, he was gonna get into trouble anyway. Uh, but uh, legislators heard from constituents that there were problems uh, from these accidents. Uh, from the use, and so they went ahead and created uh, the Off-Highway Motor Vehicle Act, and it was uh, enacted uh, back in 2005, and it applies to ATVs, dirt bikes, side-by-side -side vehicles, and also snowmobiles, only when they're used for recreation and only on public land. So if you're operating on private land, or if you are operating uh, while you're doing agriculture, 
uh, then uh, you are exempt from the provisions of the Off-Highway Vehicle Act. You're not exempt from the rules of physics, but you are exempt from the Off-Highway Vehicle Act. Uh, the law was amended in 2009, and authority for rulemaking, education, and enforcement was given to the Department of Game and Fish, because uh, we have a track record with hunter education and also enforcement of the uh, uh, game laws. So, let me expand on that. so when it was given to Game and Fish, uh, I think a lot of people automatically assume that only game wardens can enforce it. But when I, what I do, like I said, I go around the state to all the academies, all the BLM, forest, sheriff, state police. So I, I make sure that they know that they're responsible for enforcing this as well. Um, we don't do tribal yet. I know I, I've been approached by several, but uh, they've got their own rules. And, and I think they enforce it a little bit, but not under state law or state rule. Um, so yeah. Just because you see a game warden doesn't mean he's the only one who can do it. It's, it I go around and make sure, like I said, it's everybody's responsibility to, to act and keep the kids safe. So our program is funded by off-highway vehicle registrations. If you purchase a machine uh, for agriculture, you're not required to register it, but if you purchase it knowing that you're going to be using it also for recreation, uh, then you are required to have a registration sticker. Uh, it's uh, $50 for two years. Uh, and that money goes into a uh, trail safety fund where it's uh, stolen by the legislature. No, I didn't say that. Uh, it goes into a trail safety fund where it uh, funds our program as long as we make sure that the legislature can't sweep it from the fund before we get our hands on it. Uh, so the act directs funding for safety training, uh, law enforcement officer training, uh, enforcement, and also for trail improvement, uh, mitigation, grants. We've had a grant program that helps to uh, 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 fund trail projects with the Forest Service, with the BLM, and then we also uh, help pay for enforcement in the areas where people are recreating on the machines. Question, yes. Yeah, if they're owned by a state agency, they're exempt. If they're being used for the purposes of agriculture, they're exempt. Uh, uh, if, if they're used on private property, they're exempt. So, uh, so here are the exemptions. Persons using them on private lands, uh, machines that are uh, ex uh, exclusively used on private lands, machines that are owned by government agencies, uh, machines that are owned by non-residents and are being brought into the state for organized and sanctioned competition. We do have a racing, a couple of racing series uh, that uh, uh, visits various locations around the state and those machines are exempted from registration requirements. Uh, any that are being used for agricultural operations uh, and then uh, distributor, manufacturer, stock and trade uh, that's not being used as a demo fleet. Uh, now, like I said, there was a law passed about a year and a half ago that allows for paved road use under certain conditions. Uh, a local authority like a village or town council or a county commission has to pass a local ordinance or resolution allowing, specifically allowing on certain roads uh, within their jurisdiction or the State Transportation Commission has to pass a resolution allowing for operation on a certain uh, piece of state highway. And the pavement road, uh, pavement use only applies to side-by-sides and ATVs in some jurisdictions if the ordinance is passed. Uh, and those OHVs used on pavement must have headlights, taillights, brakes, mirrors, and mufflers. Uh, their operators must have a driver's license, proof of insurance, and eye protection. And if it's an uh, operator under the age of 18, all the youth uh, safety requirements apply. And the local authorities can add extra laws, such as speed limits, uh, uh, times of day to be operating, uh, daylight hours versus nighttime hours, uh, et cetera. Now, uh, I talked a little bit about what started the law happening in the first place, and it was mostly accidents involving youth operators. And so uh, the legislators figure adults are pretty much gonna do what they're gonna do, but if we can get to the uh, kids and remind them of things that they need to be responsible for, 
then the kids can remind their parents and we can start good habit formation at an early age there. So the law requires kids to wear an approved helmet and eye protection. Uh, it requires them to have an OHV safety permit, which is proof that they've been through some sort of uh, OHV safety training. Uh, they're not allowed to carry passengers at any time. Uh, they're required to have supervision unless they are old enough that they've got a driver's license, motorcycle license, or instruction permit. Uh, and nobody under the age of six years, uh, six years is allowed to operate an ATV on public land. Motorcycle is okay, but not an ATV. Uh, as far as protective gear, kids are, allowed, are uh, required to wear a uh, helmet uh, that is uh, fastened at all times. And it has to meet the, either the DOT standard or the European Union e ECE 2205 standard. And that's basically a helmet intended for uh, motor vehicle use, uh, intended for paved road use, even though it's an off-road environment. Uh, and it'll have a sticker on the back of it that says DOT and it may also have that ECE sticker on it. Uh, that sticker is evidence that that helmet is good. Uh, bicycle helmets, not, not good under the law. You know, any helmet is going to help protect the head from injuries, but the law requires DOT approved helmets. Uh, eye protection also has to be worn by kids under the age of 18, and that can be goggles or safety glasses, or it can be the kind of helmet that's got a face shield on it, uh, but it has to be real eye protection. It can't just be sunglasses. Uh, real eye protection is going to meet either the VESC-8 or Z87.1 or Z87 plus standard. Uh, kids are also required to take some sort of OHV safety training and carry proof when they're operating on public lands. Uh, operators are